Hi, Peter Letterman of Soundsmith, and we're going to continue the discussion of skating force and anti-skating. This is part two. So where we left off was there are various alignments you can do with overhang like Bearwald or Lofgren. Those are pretty much the same. There's one called Stevenson. And essentially what these alignments attempt to do is, again, you know, the head shell is cocked with respect to the end of the tone arm, and they attempt to set the cartridge at a particular angle and distance uh, so that the null points, the two null points in the arc that the cantilever traces across the playing surface of the record, the tone arm, cantilever and stylus, uh, trace across the surface of the playing record, uh, the different alignments put the null points at different places along that arc. Stevenson basically puts the null point, the second null point, closer to the end of the record and is better in principle for people that are playing classical music primarily because classical music tends to have crescendos towards the end of the music. And if you want the stylus to be in best phase alignment with the groove in terms of its lead or lag or rotation in the groove along that arc, then Stevenson may be the best alignment for you. Typically Bearwald or Lofgren, which are almost identical, those are the two best alignments. Now, anti-skating, again, why do you need it? Well, in order to get the Bearwald or Lofgren or Stevenson alignments, you have to have a cocked head shell. Well, Weird things happen when you tilt the cartridge in the head shell. So let's let's talk about that for a minute. So here's a cartridge and here's a tone arm. I'm sorry, cock the cartridge with respect to the tone arm. My mistake. So here's a cartridge and a tone arm. And now we're going to tilt the cartridge like this on the head shell because the head shell is tilted on the end of the tone arm. Well, the funny thing happens um, there is drag on the stylus of this cartridge, and uh, the stylus, of course, as the record is moving by. So, what does that mean? Well, if the cartridge were mounted straight on the tone arm, and there's drag on the stylus tip as it plays in the record groove, that would pull the tone arm this way. Of course, it can't move because the back of the tone arm is fixed in a pivot or a bearing. But what happens when you tilt the cartridge? Well, interesting thing happens. It pulls on the cartridge not straight down, but it pulls on an angle, as if the pivot were here. Well, what does that do? Well, imagine if you had something really weird, something kind of freaky, like a big curved gate, a gate that was curved all the way over to one side. And you went over to the gate and unhinged it, and you pulled on it. Which way would the gate swing? Well, the gate would swing to wherever the hinge point was. It wouldn't pull in the direction that, that you're pulling it. It would swing over towards where the hinge is. So in the case of the cartridge, which is tilted, when you pull on it this way, it tends to swing in because the pivot is not over here. Remember, the pivot is over here. The pivot's over here. So what happens is the whole tone arm tends to swing in towards the center of the record. And here's where that creates a problem. It puts a lot more force on the inside groove wall than on the outside groove walls. You have uneven tracking force on different ends of, or different edges rather of the styli. So that's why you need anti-skating. Anti-skating is a force that swings the tone arm outwards to counteract the inward skating force. So here are a couple of problems associated with that. <clears throat> How much skating force is there and is it constant? The answer is um, varying amounts and no. The skating force depends on how much friction there is against the stylus and the groove. Well, wait a minute. If you have a loud passage and a lot of modulations or bumps in the groove, doesn't that make more stiction or more friction? 
Yeah, it does, which means you're going to get more skating force in towards the center of the record. What if there's a pianissimo or even an unmodulated section? Will there be a lot less skating force? Sure. So how do you compensate for varying amounts of skating force? Not well. So you choose an anti-skating amount that works best on average. How do you do that? Do you get a test record that lets you do that? No, there isn't any. And a lot of test records have test tracks that um, suggest that you play them in order to get the distortion even on both channels or actually get the distortion to go away. If it's more on one channel, you adjust the anti-skating to get it to go away. A lot of the tracks on a lot of the records made are absolutely useless for doing that. Why? Because the signal level on those tracks is recorded really loud, some at 80 or 90 percent of full recording level or full modulation level. Um, gee, what kind of music does that? Is that what most music is like? Is music always super loud? No, of course not. Heavy metal is. Um, Hip-hop is. But most music is not. Orchestral music has loud and quiet passages and rock and roll and folk and jazz. So how do you adjust the skating force to get it right most of the time? Well, we're fortunate to have a gentleman named Frank Schroeder in the world, one of the famous tone arm designers in the world, in my estimation, probably the maker of the finest tone arms in the world, um, who did some interesting experiments. He uh, noted that music is, on average, about 30 or 40 percent modulation. That is, music spends, most music spends 90 to 95 percent of its time at about 30 or 40 percent modulation. So it stands to reason you want to adjust the anti-skating to match the skating force. That's a result of where music spends 90 or 95 percent of its time, or about 30 or 40 percent modulation. So he did the experiments and he tested that, and then he came up with a unique method of measuring how to adjust the anti-skating for 30 or 40 percent modulation. And what he did was he took a stylus and he dropped it down at the end of the record between the runout grooves. Not in the runout groove at the end of the record, but on the surface, the top of the record where the unpressed region of the record is, where it's mirror smooth. Now, when you drop a stylus there, it's only going to stay there for a moment before the end groove picks it up. But if you observe the arm at that time, and you get the anti-skating adjusted so that the tone arm moves inwards towards the spindle slowly, that's about the best adjustment you can do for anti-skating. It's the best compromise. Now you may say, wait a minute, you just said anti-skating is a function of how much modulation there is, but how about tracking force? If you have more tracking force, isn't there more skating force? Well, of course. Um, so how does that work with Frank's method? Well, it works really well because generally the tip of all styli, even though this shows the contact line riding deeper in the groove, if you look at the tip radius, the actual tip radius, it's actually the portion that's going to hit the record is a tiny, tiny amount. So it's almost the same radius. So you have the same surface area hitting the record. And if you use more tracking force, you'll have more skating. So you use more anti-skating to get the same result. That is, on the surface of the record, between the runout grooves, it moves in very, very slowly. So this turns out to be a really good way to adjust the anti-skating force for any tone arm, any stylus, any tracking force. Uh, and the responses I've had to Frank's method over the years have been, gee, you know, I tweak my tone arm for that uh, amount of anti-skating force, and you know, it generally sounds better. It sounds a lot better. Um, is it a little undercompensated for a loud passage? Yes. 
What does that do? Well, theoretically what it means is there's a little bit less tracking force on the outer groove wall than there should be. If you have enough tracking force, you're not going to miss track for that moment, so you'll probably be okay. And under quiet passages, you'll have a little bit too much tracking force on the inner groove wall, but since the modulation is low, there's not going to be any mistracking. So what this basically does is it gives you best overall performance, minimum stylus wear, and minimum record wear, and it's the right thing to do. So there are people that say you don't need tracking force, or, or anti-skating rather, so um, that's absolutely incorrect. If you have a cocked head shell on your tone arm, it's physics, it creates a skating force. And if you don't believe that you need anti-skating, I suggest dropping the head shell down on that uh, inner portion of the record on the surface and watch how quickly it flies in towards the spindle and then try to scale it down, that large force, to the tiny little contacts area, contact areas of the diamond and tell me that that uneven force is going to give you great performance. It isn't. So someone who tells you anti-skating is simply not required, or you don't need it, these are people that don't believe in physics, or that my UFO over my left shoulder has now gone to sleep, because as you can see, they turned the lights out. Good chatting with you, Peter Letterman of Sutton Smith.